We'd like to welcome you to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin for tonight's Bible study. We are in the book of Exodus. We are continuing in this series of lessons and it is time for us to be in Exodus chapter 6 tonight. So I want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with me to Exodus chapter 6. We'll be there in just a few moments, but we're very glad that you joined us tonight. As always, if you have any questions or concerns about class, Anything that we need to be praying about, any way that we can help you, we would love to hear from you. You can send me an email at info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can send a text or make a phone call as well to 608-224-0274, and we would love to hear from you. And we also want to invite you to uh, find us on social media by going online and searching for Four Lakes Church. And we also want to invite you to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't done that already and uh, turn on notifications so you can be reminded whenever we go live or add something new to that channel. But tonight we're back to the book of Exodus, and of course God's people are scattered throughout the land of Egypt, but God has chosen Moses to lead his people to freedom. Uh, Moses is extremely reluctant, to say the least. We went through a series of uh, five or six major excuses over the past several chapters, but ultimately he is willing to obey and do as God has instructed. He's 80 years old at this point, and I think that may be something that we overlook from time to time. We don't realize how old Moses actually is. But 80 years old, and he first appears to Pharaoh at the age of 80 in last week's study of Genesis chapter 5. He demands that Pharaoh let the people go. Pharaoh basically says, no way. That's uh, my paraphrase of what Pharaoh says. No possible way are you leaving. And uh, then he makes the lives of the Israelites even more difficult than before, forcing them not only to make bricks as they were previously, but now they must also gather their own straw from throughout the land of Egypt. And of course, that spreads the people out, making it that much more difficult for them to leave. So let's jump back into it tonight, and we'll pick up tonight with Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for under compulsion he will let them go, and under compulsion he will drive them out of his land. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also establish my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Well, after last week's episode where Pharaoh is confronted and refuses and increases the labor and abuse, God now lets Moses know that uh, Pharaoh will let the people go, but he won't let them go willingly. God will have to force him to let his people go. He will do it under compulsion. And so God has decided that his people will be leaving Egypt. And uh, now that we know uh, it will be happening without Pharaoh's consent or cooperation, unfortunately, of course, for Pharaoh, that's uh, his choice to make. Uh, we may learn a lesson here that God will accomplish his will, won't he? And uh, he'll do it with or without us. And of course, it's much better for us if we're on his side uh, to be working with the Lord as opposed to working against the Lord as Pharaoh was. Uh, but Pharaoh here uh, has obviously decided to work against the Lord's plan. Uh, but notice not only will Pharaoh let God's people go, but uh, he will actually drive them out of his land. So something will happen then that will change Pharaoh's mind. And uh, this is a very stubborn man. And so whatever happens will be overwhelmingly spectacular. And I find this kind of interesting because I think we're going to find out over the next few chapters uh, that God's people really <laughs> weren't willing to leave. They had a hard time leaving. And so uh, maybe this plays into it here that Pharaoh will actually have to drive them out of his land. So uh, he doesn't even cooperate at first, but finally he comes around and uh, all of this will obviously work together for the best. Well, starting in verse 2, God now seems to reassure Moses, uh, reminding Moses that he is the same God who appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, his forefathers. Uh, he appeared to them primarily as God Almighty. But notice he is now revealing himself to Moses and the people as the Lord, all capital, L-O-R-D, as Yahweh. Uh, Lord, in all caps, in most of our modern translations, is simply the translator's way of letting us know that we have the word Yahweh, 
in the original language. This is God's covenant name or God's personal name, we might say, not a title as most of the other designations might be, but this is God's name, going back to the idea of God being the I am. He is the existing one, in a sense. God simply is. Well, some have seen a contradiction here that God did, in fact, reveal himself to Abraham and the others as Yahweh back in Genesis, and I know we've studied this in the fairly recent past, uh, but he seems to say here that this is new, that he didn't reveal himself in this way in the past. I'll try to include a good article on this in the description, uh, the YouTube description of tonight's video. This is an article by Eric Lyons from Apologetics Press. If you are not able to find the description, go online, search for Apologetics Press, and then uh, punch in Exodus chapter 6, and I'm sure that'll lead you in that direction. Uh, but uh, Eric Lyons clarifies that the word know in Hebrew often refers to knowing by experience. So not just knowledge of something, but actually knowing it firsthand. And so I think in that sense, God is now causing his people to truly know him as Yahweh. Not just by using the name, but by experiencing the fact that God truly is the one and only God. And they're about to know this in a way that their ancestors really did not truly understand. So they are about to experience this personally and deeply in a way that others have not. So I think that is a good way of explaining that. Uh, then we have a reminder here at the end of this paragraph that God made a covenant with his people, an agreement with his people long ago, and now he has heard the groaning of his people, and now he has remembered his covenant. Not that he forgot it before, not that he made a promise and uh, waited a few hundred years and, oh yeah, I did promise that, not that at all. Uh, but he remembers it now in the sense that he's about to start fulfilling that promise that he made so many years earlier to Abraham and the others. And, uh, and how comforting this must have been to Moses uh, to know that uh, all of the past and the experiences of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have really uh, led up to this moment in time. And now Moses has a, a very honorable role to play in all of this. So let's continue tonight with Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, the next paragraph. Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. So Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses on account of their despondency and cruel bondage. Previously, God had Moses communicating to Pharaoh in that previous chapter, but now Moses is to address the people. And notice he is to bring them this message from God, letting them know what is about to happen. He promises to redeem them with an outstretched arm with great judgments. So there is the, the picture of strength here, a mighty warrior bearing a sword, that kind of picture. And he is to redeem them. To redeem is to buy back. That's a very uh, common Bible term, to buy back. We sometimes talk about redeeming a coupon these days. Uh, cashing in the uh, kids' meal tokens from Culver's, ten of those for a free meal. But that we are exchanging one thing for another thing. And obviously this idea of redemption is carried over into the New Testament as well. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. As Peter says in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19, we were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but we were redeemed with precious blood, a blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And so God then is introducing this concept of redemption. He's about to, to do something to rescue or redeem his people out of the land of Egypt. However, also let's notice in verse 9 that the people... They didn't listen to Moses, did they, on account of their despondency and the cruel bondage that they were under. So they were uh, so beaten down in Egypt, we might say, that they didn't really care. Uh, they had too much going on to even be concerned about this. They were too oppressed uh, even to be interested in their own freedom, in their own redemption. Maybe it was so bad they really didn't think this was possible. And uh, doesn't that sometimes happen to us today? It's so easy to get overwhelmed and disillusioned 
by life or by sin, that it's just, it's almost impossible to even think of finding our way out of it. Even when God shows us the way, we don't always take that way. We don't always follow that plan. Uh, but let's also think about this from Moses' point of view for a few moments. He didn't want to do this. He had no plans. He was out there 80 years old serving as a shepherd in the land of Midian, getting the job done. Um, you know, he didn't want to go back to Egypt. God had to pretty much uh, come close to compelling him, just as he's about to compel Pharaoh. And uh, Moses kind of had to have his arm twisted into leading God's people. And now the people he was sent to, uh, they want nothing to do with it. Um, you know, how discouraging, how frustrating that must have been for Moses. And, I, you know, there are two ways of looking at this. First of all, there are times when we might be in the position of Moses. You know, we may be trying to tell people what the Lord can do for them. And it's so exciting that we've been saved. We've been relieved. Uh, sins have been forgiven. I, I want to share this with you. But there are many times when people just don't care. Um, and they're kind of like the people of Israel here. Um, we've got our stuff going on. Uh, we don't have time for this. Life is too busy. Things are happening. Uh, but secondly, and kind of on the other hand, we may be the ones who are getting uh, told about what the Lord can do for us. We're the ones who sometimes don't care or maybe don't listen as we should. But, you know, either way, uh, this would have been so frustrating for Moses as a leader to uh, not want to do this. And then he is talked into it by God. He finally puts himself out there as a leader, putting his own life on the line to speak to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's tightening the screws. He's coming down hard on him. And now the people that he's supposed to be leading uh, they're unwilling to follow. You know, what in the world am I doing here? This is just a, a futile situation. I'm, I'm wasting my life. I should have just stayed back there in the land of Israel or uh, Midian, rather, watching those sheep would have been a much a better way to go. I'd just die of old age out there at least. All right, let's continue then tonight with Exodus 6, verses 10 through 13, the next paragraph. Exodus chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. How then will Pharaoh listen to me, for I am unskilled in speech? Then the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, and gave them a charge to the sons of Israel and to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Let's notice, first of all, here that, that God doesn't give up. God could have very easily said, forget it. I, I'm going to let them suffer for a few more hundred years, and maybe then they'll come around. But God doesn't give up. You know, even though the people didn't care and listen to what Moses was saying in that previous paragraph, God presses forward. And again, God could have very easily said, fine, stay in bondage. Uh, but he doesn't do that. Instead, God continues pushing it. He continues making progress toward fulfilling this promise that he had made to Abraham. So Moses is to go back to Pharaoh now, a second time. Uh, not with a request, but with a demand this time. Go tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. If you remember before, it was more of a request. Uh, Please let us go so we can offer sacrifices to the Lord in the wilderness. And so this right here, this, this ratchets it up a notch, doesn't it? And now Moses, <laughs> with this new mission, he seems to be scared, seems to be a little terrified, maybe unsure of himself again. You know, first of all, the people aren't listening. And then secondly, how in the world is Pharaoh going to listen to me? You know, he's this world leader, and I'm just this guy. I I'm a shepherd from the middle of nowhere. You know, I am unskilled in speech. I'm not good at doing this. I I'm not a public speaker. And I know we've already dealt with this objection. Um, God covered this way back in the burning bush. Uh, but sometimes we give the same excuse to God over and over again, don't we? God, I can't do it for this reason. And then a few months later, God, I can't do it for this reason. I can't do it for this reason. Over and over. And uh, Moses comes back with this one here. So now God gives this message and this mission not just to Moses. Uh, but notice in this paragraph, he addresses this to Aaron as well. And this was the solution that had been agreed upon previously, but Moses seems to have uh, conveniently forgotten about that, that Aaron was given to him as a spokesperson. Um, you know, here's a thought question. Do we also need to be told something twice from time to time? Do you ever need to be reminded of something, especially from God, especially in a religious sense? I mean, absolutely. Uh, sometimes we read something in God's word and maybe due to fear, maybe due to some other human weakness, we get sucked into it again and we forget, don't we? And we need to be reminded. 
And sometimes we need to be reminded again. And sometimes we need to be reminded again, over and over and over again. And sometimes I wonder whether this is why we have the four gospel accounts. God could have very easily told us what we needed to know in a series of bullet points, <laughs> kind of like the Ten Commandments. Uh, but that's not how he chose to reveal himself to us under the New Covenant. We have these four somewhat parallel gospel accounts. So we get the same message multiple times from four different perspectives, using different words, different scenarios. And even in the rest of the Bible, we have the same basic message repeated in different ways, don't we? Sometimes God speaks in the form of poetry. Uh, sometimes in the form of a parable, sometimes in the form of the account of somebody's life or some personal story and so on. So the Bible is quite repetitive and there is a value to it. But here Moses has to be told yet again that Aaron will help him out here. And the fact that Moses is not a good public speaker, that's not a factor. Uh, God, uh, God is not slowed down by our weakness. He will get the job done through us or, or not. And so God wants him to go to Pharaoh with this message, and Moses' inability or ability to speak is, is not an issue here. And I think, again, that's a good reminder for us. Whether we are skilled in speech is not a factor for us either. If God wants us to do something, if he tells us to do something in his word, um, as our creator, we know he has confidence in us, that we have it within us to do it. Well, in the next paragraph, we come to a huge list of names, and I know it's been a while since we faced uh, one of the genealogy-type chunks of Scripture, and uh, some of these are kind of frustrating in a sense because we have so many names that don't seem very relevant to us. And I know we have a lot of text on the screen here, and I left it this way for a reason. We're not slowing down and uh, going through this word by word, name by name. But let's just uh, read through this rather, or rather briefly. Uh, let's get the big picture here before we move on to close out the chapter with the paragraph after one. So uh, this is Exodus chapter 6, uh, and we're continuing with verses 14 through 27. Exodus 6, 14 through 27. These are the heads of their father's households. The sons of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, Hanak and Palu, Hezron and Carmi. These are the families of Reuben. The sons of Simeon, Jemuel, and Jamin, and Ohad, and Jachin, and Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations, Gershon, and Kohath, and Merari, and the length of Levi's life was 137 years. The sons of Gershon, Libni, and Shimei, according to their families, the sons of Kohath, Amram, and Izhar, and Hebron and Uziel, and the length of Kohath's life was 133 years. The sons of Merai, Mahli, and Mushai, they are, these are the families of the Levites according to their generations. Amram married his father's sister Jochebed, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the length of Amram's life was 137 years. The sons of Izhar, Korah, and Nepheg, and Zikri, the sons of Uziel, Mishael, and Elzaphan and Sithri. Aaron married Elisheba, the daughter of Aminadab, the sister of Nashon, and she bore him Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. The sons of Korah, Asir, and Elkanah, and Abisaph, and these are the families of the Korahites. Aaron's son Eleazar married one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phinehas. These are the heads of the father's households of the Levites according to their families. It was the same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring out the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their hosts. Uh, they were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the sons of Israel from Egypt. It was the same Moses and Aaron. Well, again, we don't need to go through this uh, verse by verse, but just as we look at this paragraph as a whole, it kind of looks like we have an incredibly brief summary of some of the heads of various households, focusing in on the tribes of Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, and focusing in really, most of all, on the tribe of Levi. And the reason primarily is that Moses is from the tribe of Levi, but also uh, the Levites are going to go on to take a leading role in the giving of the law later in the book of Exodus. And so it seems to me that in this paragraph, Moses is laying some groundwork, basically to get us to that point. So he gives the sons of Jacob only up to Levi. So Levi is the main point here. Once he gets to Levi, he doesn't go through uh, Issachar and Dan and Naphtali and all those. Those really don't matter. 
uh, in terms of the main point of the book of Exodus. So he's introducing us to the cast of characters that will play a, a prominent role throughout the rest of this book. Uh, in terms of names we might recognize, you know, if we were to go through and highlight a few that kind of pop out to us, uh, we've got Moses and Aaron, don't we? Th those are the ones that are repeated most often in this paragraph. Their family relationships are outlined here. Uh, in that number, we have, notice, Nadab and Abihu. They're going to go on to be killed in uh, Leviticus chapter 10 for offering unauthorized fire before the Lord. Uh, Phineas is also known for his zeal in killing the man and the woman who were apparently committing adultery before the Lord. Uh, the whole situation with Balaam and all that over in Numbers chapter 25 and following. So we kind of get a few highlights like you're going to see these guys again. So you need to know this guy, this guy, this guy, and that guy uh, in this paragraph seems to be the way I would take that. So uh, like I said, we've got this huge list of names, a few highlights. We're not going through it verse by verse, but uh, just giving the... Uh, first readers of this account a, a bit of history and especially to give them a clue as to how Moses and Aaron fit in the family tree here which is where this paragraph ends. So let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph. This is Exodus chapter 6 verses 28, 29, and 30. Exodus 6, 28 through 30. Now it came about on the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I speak to you. But Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am unskilled in speech. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? Well, this is pretty much a repeat, isn't it, of how we started this chapter. And I don't know if it's a, a double account of the same thing, or if this happens yet again. I wouldn't be surprised if it happens again. You know, oh, uh, Lord, by the way, did you not know that, that I can't talk? Uh, you know, one more excuse uh, leading up to this. Uh, but in a sense, this almost just introduces us to what comes next in chapter 7. So God tells Moses, go back to Pharaoh. Moses is scared. He's not a good public speaker. And this leads us into an expanded role for Aaron in the following chapter. So in a sense, the last three verses here really are kind of a transition into the next part of this uh, uh, book of Exodus. So this brings us to the end of Exodus 6. Uh, tonight we've had God tell Moses to go back to Pharaoh. He doesn't want to. Uh, God has remembered the covenant. He will uh, rescue his people out of the land of Egypt. It will not be easy. I think that's a reminder we have. This is not going to be an easy project. And we have a bit of a preview of the rest of the book of Exodus. We've also got the reminder um, that there will not be an easy relationship between Moses and the people. And that's a, a kind of a highlight or a low light of this chapter. He's come to rescue them on God's behalf, but they don't get it. They're not quite ready to go. They are too disillusioned in their suffering to really appreciate what God is doing through Moses. Um, and with that, thank you so much for joining us tonight, for taking the time. I, I hope to see most of you this coming Lord's Day in person at 930 as we get back to our study of the one-chapter books in the Bible, I think John Higgins is on deck to uh, uh, start that two-part little kind of series within a series. This will be on the book of Third John. So this is the fourth, I believe, of the five one-chapter books in the Bible. We are making progress. And uh, then we'll also come together at 1030 as we continue our study of Hebrews by uh, finishing uh, Hebrews chapter 10. So let's come prepared by reading maybe the, the, the last paragraph in Hebrews chapter 10. That'll get us ready for worship this coming Lord's Day. Again, if you have any questions, any comments concerning tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, something we need to be praying about, uh, we want to invite you to reach out. And uh, hopefully you can still see that on your screen there, the email address. But obviously if you're on the phone, you can't see that. So feel free to call or give a text to me. That's at uh, 608-224-0274. And we would love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Aaron and Moses. We know that you are a God who remembers your promises. And so thank you, Father, tonight for saving us from our sins. And thank you for the promise of a life coming after this one. Be with those tonight who are struggling. Be with those who are ill we pray for peace, and we pray for your hand upon them. And thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.